Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, so the version of Vagrant and VirtualBox that's on there will not. And the image is, yeah, but if you have VirtualBox and Vagrant installed separately, I think the image is a I'm on? Okay. All right, guys, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully by now everybody has had an opportunity to grab a USB drive, plug it in, and download what's on there. If, if you have not done that, can you raise your hand real quick so I get a sense of how far along we are and, and getting ready? Okay, so we've got a couple folks that are still doing that. Um, <clears throat> well, for the benefit of everybody else, I mean, if you've already copied it over, there are a couple of things that you need to do to get ready for this presentation. First of all, Make sure you got a laptop. Obviously, if you grab the USB drive, you'll probably already have assumed that. Make sure you've, down, you've got VirtualBox and Vagrant installed on there. So um, on the USB drive, there is a folder that has different versions of that software there. So if you didn't get a chance to download that and install that before the start, you can go ahead and do so now. Um, make sure that, that you've got at least 30 gigabytes of free disk space on your laptop. And then finally, if you are using Windows, um, make sure you've got some, some, some sort of SSH client, whether it's PuTTY or something else. Um, we have found there are some issues um, with getting Vagrant to do exactly everything we want it to do. So just everything, do everything up until the point where it's time to SSH in and then just switch over to your other client. Um, <clears throat> so the stuff that you do need to get from the USB drive, uh, it's all up here. Copy the designate install directory somewhere local where you uh, can get to it easily. And then you're going to switch to your um, terminal. And once you're in your terminal, you're going to change directory into that folder, so designate install. And once you're there, issue a vagrant up. That's going to take a little while, depending on, how, how, depending on your uh, uh, CPU and, and on your laptop. Um, once it's finished, then you just, from within that same directory, issue a vagrant SSH. So real quickly, who here has finished the vagrant up portion of this, just raise them high. Okay, so who, here, who has started it, but it's not finished? Okay, just trying to get an idea of, of uh, what to expect. Um, on the USB drive, there's a file at the root of the drive, and it, it says something to the account of installation instructions. So you can open that, and that basically has more or less what we have up here on the slides. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and start moving forward um, if you get stuck, raise your hand and raise your hand high. And we've got team members in the room, basically everybody who's, who's working on the project who can help you out. So pretty much anybody who's standing towards the back of the room, they can, they can help you. So just raise them high and we'll, we'll come help you out. Okay. So welcome to the installation workshop for Designate. We are here to help you get it installed on the VM we've provided show you some things that you can do to operate it, and just rock it. So real quick introductions. Um, we've got a real solid, tight-knit team, and I, I, would, I would like to give a chance to recognize everybody on it. So first, we've got Rich Meganson. Rich, where are you at? From Red Hat. Hey, Rich. Um, he's also available for help. If anybody is running um, Fedora, then he's got a special drive for that. So, so Rich has been working on the project now for, for a couple months. He actually just got free IPA working, so if you're interested in using that as a backend name server, um, you'll want to talk to him. Then we've got the Rackspace crew, Emmanuel Ancutze, who's over here. He's going to be walking you through the, the actual installation portion. Um, and Emmanuel is a, a contributor to the project. Betsy Luzader, who you probably met walking in. Hey, Betsy. Um, Betsy is one of the core team members, so if you're interested in contributing and you want to get a plus two, you definitely want to talk to her. And she's also available for any issues you may encounter. Vinod Mangalpali. Hey, Vinod. Vinod is also a uh, contributor, and he is available for any issues. And I'm, I'm Joe McBride, development manager. Next up, we got eBay uh, from, from eBay, Ron Rickard. 
If you were, who here was in the session at 11 o'clock? Okay, good. So if you were in the session there, you saw Ron uh, and another of our team members up there presenting. He, and and uh, Ron is going to be walking you through the operation and some of the integration portions with some of the other designate project, or some of the other OpenStack projects. So last intro slide, we've got Graham Hayes. Where's Graham? Hey, Graham. Uh, Graham did the 11 o'clock session along with Ron. Um, he is also a uh, core team member, so plus two away, Graham. And finally, I want to introduce Kyle McInnes. Hey, Kyle. Um, <laughs> Kyle is the uh, project technical lead. He also has the first commit on the project, so I, I look to him as sort of the founder and, and leader of, of this initiative. Um, and um, I don't know if you guys were here for Troy Toman's uh, talk earlier today. He very much embodies the sense of bringing a group together and working towards a common cause. So we, we commend Kyle for what he's done and, and what he continues to do for the community. Okay, so who has finished the Vagrant Up? Raise them high for me. Okay. All right, who has started the Vagrant Up? Okay, who is, who is almost at the Vagrant Up portion? Okay, so two people. Is there anybody else, other than those two folks, is there anybody else that's, that's going to try to go through the install and is having some problems or hasn't sat down and got started yet? Okay. Okay, well. Um, yeah, yeah, let us know. Go ahead and raise them high if it's if it's continuing to take a while. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue forward and and we'll do our best to to circle back and help you guys. Okay, real quick, the agenda as I mentioned, Emmanuel and Kutze is gonna walk us through the install. Ron is gonna take us through operations as well as the Nova Neutron portion, uh, specifically the integration that we have there, and then finally our. Uh, project technical lead, Kyle, is going to show you how to contribute and, and take, it from, take it to the next level if you're interested. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Emmanuel, who's going to show you how to install. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Again, my name is Emmanuel Ankutsa from uh, Rackspace. So uh, we're going to, I'm going to walk you through the install and hopefully everybody has, uh, at least most of you already have your uh, Vagrant, I mean the uh, VM app. Uh, a couple of slides before we actually uh, get on there. So uh, just in the next 15 or 20 minutes at most, we're going to spend time installing the services for designate and then we will configure the PowerDNS backend, which is what we are going to use for this session, and verify that the installation is good, and then we'll hand it off to Ron to walk us through some of the uses of uh, Designate. A quick review or overview of where Designate fits within OpenStack. Um, the colored or the orange uh, boxes um, are the components that we're going to be installing here. So Designate has the API, the front end, which talks about MQ, RabbitMQ, to Central. Central is the repository for uh, everything that comes in. Um, and it has a, a database that it stores everything in there that is pluggable. We have SQL Alchem Alchemy in front of it, so you can plug anything in there. Right now, it is MySQL. And then the information flows on to the back end, and which is where real DNS happens when you come and resolve against names and all that. Uh, for today, we're going to be using Power DNS. Now, the VM you have has a few things already installed for you, just so we can move along uh, quickly. We have Nova Neutron installed, uh, Keystone, and um, we will do a little bit of configuration of some of those as we go. Like uh, Joe mentioned, if you are on the v VM right now, you should be in Home Vagrant. If you do on LS, you should see uh, one of the files there is installed.txt. 
that file is going to contain the commands that we're going to be using and some of the instructions. In fact, if you would please do a cut of that file, copy it, and maybe paste it into some kind of a text editor on your host because we're going to be going, you know, copying and pasting so that, uh, you know, if you're like me, I fart finger a lot and that, that will help us quite a bit. Now, on the wiki, we also have, we have the instructions on wiki as well. We'll make this available at some point and you can go and walk through this again. So you have lots of ways to get to the instructions for uh, working this thing. Okay, now, if you don't mind, I'll sit down because I'm gonna be typing and uh, we'll walk through this uh, right now. Good, so I'm in the VM myself. I'm in home uh, Vagrant and to the side is my cheat sheet, like, you know, if, if you copied your stuff over, this is what you would see. So, in, in this uh, directory, we're gonna go in one more step to so we can install the packages and dependencies for designate. So I would copy this first line here. Boom. The second line is one that we did for you ahead of time while installing the VM, so we don't need to do that. We'll skip to the next one, which is the pseudo pip install the requirements for designate. And that too, we will only do the first part of it, which is without the test requirements. It will take a bit more time to install those and we actually don't need them right now. So we'll go ahead and install only what we need for that. Everybody with me? Finally, we set up the installation and it looks like that went well. Everybody with me? Okay, we'll continue. Now we're gonna uh, set up the configuration file for designate. Now to do that, we're gonna step two more steps deeper into the directory structure, etc designate. So the full path then is home vagrant designate, etc designate, etsy designate. Now, typically what you would do at this point is make copies of your configuration file. By the way, this is what we have in there. We have templates for our config files. You make copies of those that you need and make changes to them and, and go from there. The one we are interested in is designate conf, and this is the template for it. Now, we have I've provided the, we have a little um, you know, command here, shell command, that would do that copy for us. So let's do that and see what happens. Hey, yes? You may want to slow down a little, just okay. to make sure everybody's with you. Okay. Please let me know if uh, I'm going too quickly. Any questions or stuff or anything? Time's up, so we can come up yeah. Is everybody already at this step? Who's not at this step? Okay, those are the hands up. Yeah, put your hand up again and somebody will come around. Okay, I'm gonna continue to, to run this next command. All right. So after that, we have designate.conf, which is a copy of the uh, sample, the template file. Um, we also have a copy of the root wrap uh, configuration. So normally what you would do then is at this point, you would pick up your favorite editor, open up the designate config file and edit it to your um, suit, whatever you want to uh, put it, um, configure in there. But for the purposes of this uh, workshop, we have already written a config file that works. And so we're gonna copy that on top of this. And that is what the next command is. We are copying from home vagrant designate conf workshop onto this um, 
configuration file over here. Okay, now we will come back and go into the config file and I can show you what's in there. Uh, every component that we touch in OpenStack has some configuration in here. Additionally, in addition to configuring the components that BigUp designate. But for now, trust me, we have the right stuff in there. What we're gonna do next is to create a couple of directories for designate to use. One of those is gonna be a directory where designate can store state information. The other one will be a location to put log files. So let's go ahead and create Yes. Um, I, I'm on a Windows box, and I did the Baker SSH, and I've got that up. If I want to use my own SSH client, what credentials do I use to get into the box? You can use Vagrant. Okay. 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 So. Um, I will continue to the next step. Um, so this is the first directory we're going to create, and this will be for storing state information. So we've done that. Manual? Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. I went over that a little bit too fast, I think. Okay. Can you make those commands a little bit Oh, okay. Yes. Pardon? Yes. Now, excuse me. When you go to home Vagrant, the installer TXT, and you display that file, it's exactly the same thing you have in here. So you have it there, and then we have it on the wiki as well. Okay. So we have created the directories that we need, one for logs and one for state. Now, as part of the installation of the VM, we started the, we installed PowerDNS for you, which is the, the, the back end. And we just want to check quickly to make sure that the configuration that is in there is what we expect. To do that, we're going to look at a file in the etc, in the etc power DNS, um, you know, that, uh, directory down there. And so this is the file. And so when we do a cut, I am mainly looking for the database name to be pdns at this point. When we go back into the config file, designate.conf, there will be an entry there. And there will be a database connection uh, string in there, part of which has to match this. So just to check that for now. A quick check to see if PowerDNS, the back end, the service is up and running. So what I'm looking for is something sitting on port 53 and it should be this This one right here. So Power DNS is up, it is running, and this is our back end. We will come back to, to this. 
One other check we can do is to try to do a dig against PowerDNS at this point. It's not completely set up because we still need to initialize the database that it works with, but at least we should get some kind of a response from it. Okay, so status fail because we, we don't know anything, the server doesn't know anything about this, but this is a successful communication with the service. So we know that PowerDNS is up and running. The next step is to create, initialize, and sync up our database for designate. Is everybody with me at this point? Most, some people are. Okay. Okay. I'm moving. All right. So here we go. I am going to create that database. And then we're going to initialize it using some of the designate utilities, designate manage. And what this next command does is to put in or create the schema for designate. And we have, okay, no such file. Okay, so it's looking for the, the log directory. So we'll go back and make sure that we created that log directory I have another uh, window here. Let me see if. No such. Okay. So we probably, I probably didn't execute that uh, command. Let's go ahead and try it. Okay. Now, okay, so now if we go back in my other window to the location, um, we should start seeing some uh, well, that's not yet okay, there we go. That is a, a log file and um, we can just you know, take a quick look at it. So a, a lot of things happened in there, one of which is that the database schema was initialized. Now we can go ahead and do a sync. What the sync does is to apply patches to your schema to bring it up to uh, the, the current, uh, excuse me, this is not where this should be, to the current uh, state. Okay, now if we went here and looked at the log file, we would see a lot of the uh, transactions that went on to upgrade the database. We'll do the same to the PowerDNS database, except that it, it already exists, so we only have to init and sync. And I'm gonna do these uh, a little faster. Okay, we've installed the, uh, the services and the database. Now we're going to start the services for designate. There are two, central, central, and the API itself. Now, if we do a simple PS with some grep in there, we should see the central service app and the API app as well. A couple of final things to do. We are going to set up Keystone. We're going to set up a service uh, for us to use Keystone, and to do that, we're going to first of all become admin. In Home Vagrant, we have a number of these uh, open um, RC dot files that switch from one user to another. And this is the admin, so we can go ahead and do the creation of the um, 
key, keystone service. So we've shelled the environment. Now we're going to go in and create a service called designate. And here is the unique ID for it. It's called designate, and it's of type DNS. We are going to create, we are going to tell Keystone to forward authenticated services to this service that, uh, to, to DNS. So here you can see we have this ID, which matches this ID, and this is the unique ID of the, um, the service. Now, it has three endpoints, all of which are the same, but we have it in there, and now any auth authenticated requests will be sent by Keystone to this uh, service, to, to our DNS service. Finally, let's install the client for designate. To do that, we go back to Home Vagrant Python Designate Client. And there, we're going to again install. And this time, too, we do not want to install the test requirements. So we will only do this part of it. So that does it. And then we so that finishes it. A quick test. Oh, they got tiny again. You know, you know what happened? I probably selected a section and did the plus, so. Okay, sorry. Is that okay? Good. So, we're gonna do a quick check of the client. We go back to the home where we have as you can see, we have all these users preset. And we did source the admin already. So it's redundant to do this, but. Now, we're going to use the, set, uh, the client to request for entities that we call servers from the API. Of course, we should not see any, because nothing has been put in there. So we get back an empty response. Similarly, one can also, we can check using curl to talk to the service locally on the VM. So basically, we are hitting the main endpoint. It comes back and tells us the versions that we have. We have the current one v1 and the experimental v2. And we will see some of this, I mean, how this relates to some of the uh, contents of the config file when we go back in there. In fact, one can also go to a client and try to hit the endpoint from outside of the VM. So we get back authentication required, which is something that we expect because a Keystone caught it and said, hey, you're not authenticated from the outside. You can get in here. Before I hand over to Ron, I'm going to quickly um, show you what the config file looks like. And for that, I'm going to use Vim. So the file that we had, so here it is. I'll point to a couple of things quickly. This is the state, this is the same directory that we created earlier on for state information. So it's ref uh, referenced in here. This is the log location. When it didn't exist, we had an error because the system didn't know where to put the log files. And for each, uh, system that we interact with, like um, Nova or uh, Neutron, we have configurations for them in here. But for Designate itself, the API, Central, they also have configuration in here. So here we are telling Central that we're going to be doing Power DNS as the back end. And we continue, there's going to be more. Now, Ron will show you a few other things as we go. One last thing I'd like to show you is. Um, the Power DNS backend, which has the same uh, database name reflected in there when we were doing the. So here we go. There was that one file we had to cut to, to make sure that the value there was right. It's because of this, uh, the, this uh, database string in here. 
So this file uh, is the config file, and there is more documentation on uh, these values um, and their meaning on the uh, reader docs for designate. And with that, I will, I will hand off to to Ron. Oh, now one, one quick comment. If you want to repeat this later on, in the same home vagrant directory that we have the install.txt, there is another file install-designate.sh. If you run that, it should run everything and get the whole thing installed for you just in case you want to do it over again or something like that. Now, there is one comment. The second line in there is um, set ex. You might have to uncomment, I mean, comment that out, or just do vagrant destroy and then vagrant up and run that. Okay. Thank you. Well, are there any questions about the installation portion of the uh, workshop? No. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Does sync? Did we install sync as well? We well no, no, we will actually, um, we will actually configure and, and um, run sync a little bit later in, the, in this. So at this point, you should have the API up and running, and you should have central up and running. Are there any other questions? No. Nope. It's hard to see. The lights are really bright up here. So if you do have a question, speak up. If you're raising your hand, I can't see you. <laughs> OK. So at this point, let's go ahead and uh, talk about um, what can I do. Got this thing installed now. I need to do something with it. Uh, before we get into that, though, I do want to tell you, pre-installed on the image that you're using, um, we did some work already for you in Keystone. We have some tenants set up for you, and we have some users set up for you. Uh, we have an admin tenant, and it has an admin user. Uh, we have a tenant A, and it has a user 1 and a user 2. And we have a tenant B, and it has a user 3 in it. Again, if you attended the earlier session, uh, the reason why this is important to understand is um, domains are owned by tenants, okay? And you know, obviously, only users that are uh, members of that tenant are going to be able to do work either with the domain or the records for that tenant, okay? We also preloaded some scripts on here for you. Uh, Emmanuel talked about the OpenRC scripts and what they do, it allows us to switch between the users quickly. Um, the other scripts down at the bottom there, those are there um, to help us along with the, using the actual REST API. Uh, it's not an exhaustive set of scripts. We're basically going to create a server and delete a server. Well, this, there's a script there to delete a server and there's a script there to list the servers. Um, we, will, we will start the um, operations portion using the REST API but you'll run scripts to use it, and then we'll move over to using um, the designate client. Okay, so I'm gonna start typing, so I am gonna sit down. Uh, I will be flipping back and forth between the slides and, uh, and typing. I do not have anything for you to guys to cut and paste, so you'll be typing along with me um, if you wanna keep up with me during this portion of it. Okay, so the first thing I need you to do is just make sure you're in the home directory. So go ahead and type CD, home directory, you're logged in as Vagrant. Um, that's, where, that's where all the um, scripts that we have pre-installed for you for this portion of the demo. Let's go ahead and source the OpenRC admin. And I'm, I could be a good typer some days and I can be a horrible typer, so bear with me as you watch me type. Um, we basically switch the admin user for, um, in Keystone. This sets up, if, if, if you're familiar um, with OpenStack at all, this just sets up environment variables for you so that you can do things as that user. Uh, let's go ahead and do run the script list servers.sh. And, wow, that worked, worked like a charm. Oh, we, we skipped a step here. Okay, so we source the admin user. Now, one of the things that you, and I'm glad I did this, one of the things that you need to understand uh, when you're using the REST API is you need a token, 
okay? So, and this is, this is not any different than, than most of the other OpenStack components. You need a token to interact with them. Uh, I have some scripts that are pre-created for you that will allow you to, to get a token for this user. Um, um, the token will be scoped to the appropriate tenant for you, and, um, and then we'll use that token. The token will be put in your environment. So let's go ahead and run the, uh, the select ENV script, and that'll generate a token for you, and then if you echo it, you'll see your, your, your big, long token there. It was much shorter in the previous version of all this, but gotten bigger. Okay, um, now we do our list servers. And we have no servers created, okay? If you attended, if you attended the previous session, you, you understand that when we talk about servers here, we're really talking about NS record, okay? So the, whatever we create for servers become NS records for the zones that you create or the domains that you create later. Um, and additionally, one of, one, of those, uh, one of those records also becomes the primary domain for the SOA record. It would be what's put in there for the, yes? What did I echo? Uh, earlier I echoed the token. I just did an echo token. So the, the, when you run dot space dot select env, it actually generates a token for you. So let's go look at that script real quick. I'll just show you. It calls some other scripts, but basically it calls the get user token script. It uses those variables that we set up when we ran the um, source open RC admin. Um, and it, and it generates a token for you. It communicates with Keystone, generates a token for you. It's a scope token in this case, um, scope to the tenant for that user, which is the admin user. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and create our first server. So we'll run the create server.sh, ns.example.net, trailing dot, hit return, and we've created our first server. So what, did, what does this mean to create our first server? What this is doing is it's just creating an entry in designates storage, okay? It just created an entry in the storage, and this, this ns.example.net becomes an ns record for any zones that you create from this point forward. Once we create our first zone, any more servers that you create just become ns records for those zones, okay? Now, at this point, nothing has happened on the um, DNS backend. Okay, this is all in the designate database. I just want to make that clear. Once we create our first zone, then if you did this again, it would actually happen on the backend. But we don't have we don't have a zone for this to work with, so it just created it and put it in the designate database. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at these scripts. I just I'll, I'll go ahead and list the servers one more time, and then we'll take a look at these scripts so you can see how the rest calls work. Let's look at the create server.sh first. So not, surprise, not surprisingly, you know, um, the endpoints that we registered with the catalog in Keystone, um, the endpoint is up there at the top. I'm using localhost. I'm sure we used an IP address when we registered the endpoint, but it's port 9001. We're using the version one API. Uh, today during the operational portion of, of, of the demo, we're, we're gonna be sticking with the version one API stuff. If you attended our earlier meeting, you, uh, you probably heard that their designate does more than just what we're going to be doing today. Um, we do, uh, you do need to pass it a token. And this shouldn't be a surprise if you used any other OpenStack components in the past. Um, we do have a payload. The payload is the name of the server that we're creating. And then we have, uh, we're using the server's resource. So we specify that in the URL. Okay? So, List server, list servers .sh, whoops. Um, not a surprise there, no payload. We're just listing the servers. Um, this is, this is, these scripts are just there for you to kind of build off of in the future. If you need to use the REST API, you can look at these scripts. How did he do it? You go out to, uh, you go out to the website, um, the, the readme docs, and you can read more about the API. And then finally, I have a delete. We won't run it here, but there is a delete server script. And no surprise there, like all other OpenStack components, we're using UUIDs. Very painful, but there it is. Okay?
Okay. Um, I don't see anybody raising hands. Everybody looks like they're looking at me, so I'm going to guess everybody's cool with where we're at. Good. So let's go ahead and switch over to using the designate client. Um, we're going to go back. Uh, we're going to go back to our window there in a second. But we're, what we're going to do is we're going to first be the admin user. Whenever we do anything with servers, uh, we're going to be the admin to do it. When we start doing things with domains um, and records, we will be other users. Okay. So let's go ahead and switch back over. Everybody can see the screen and everything okay? There's no problems there? Yeah, okay, good. He's, I think that was a thumbs up. Or, or, or middle finger, I couldn't tell, so. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just changing back to the admin user. I was already the admin user, redundant, but there I go. Um, designate client, uh, the command is designate, and then you give, and then you give it a command. So I, I type designate server list, not surprisingly, gives me the same server list I saw when I ran, when I looked at the REST client, okay? Let's go ahead and create another server using the client. So we're gonna run a designate server create. Let's call this one ns.example.com instead of .net. We made a mistake. We don't want example.net. We'll delete it in a second. But let's go ahead and do um, ns.example.com. Um, trailing dot's important. Um, you just have to give it a name, hit return, and there it is. If I do a designate server list again, not surprisingly, I have, I have two servers there. Again, all of this is being done in the database. The storage for designate. There is nothing occurring at this point in, uh, on the backend DNS server. And not until we have a zone does anything happen in, on, the, on the backend server. Okay, let's go ahead and delete the original server that we had, we're gonna do a designate server delete, and we're gonna give it the UUID. Uh, forgive me, this is control. Okay, give it the UUID, hit return, and the original one should be deleted. We'll go ahead and do a designate server list again. And the original, the original um, server that we had um, is created. I'm going to go ahead and delete this final server. Designate server delete. Do a command C. And we're not allowed to delete the final server. Okay, that's just built in. Uh, once you create a server, uh, you can't delete the final one. Um, not a big deal because you probably need it anyways. But if you do want to create something that you generated earlier, just create a new one. You can delete, delete the previous one, okay? Will not let you delete the final one, okay? Now, with all of that said, there is, uh, you do not have to type designate every single time you do this stuff. There is a shell. And the shell you get into, just type designate, hit return, and you're into the designate shell. So this is very useful. Um, I think it was ingenious. I think it was a good idea. Um, and at this point, if you need to see the commands that you're able to type, just type help. There's a list of your commands. So the commands that we're typing are there, okay? So during the rest of this demo, I'll flip back and forth. You'll probably see me mostly do it from the command line, but I may, I may flip in and start using the shell. If you want to follow along using the shell, great. That's, that's perfectly acceptable. Problem is we'll be switching, switching back and forth between different users and you'll have to get out of it eventually. So, but I did want you to know that, yeah. I've noticed that you know, people are entering a domain name, they're not putting the full qualified domain name with the dot. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Okay, so I did mention it before. Whenever you're doing um, work with uh, designate, you do need the trailing dot. So please, please remember to enter the trailing dot. If you don't enter the trailing dot, I, what does it do? It gives you an error? Yeah, it gives you an error. Okay, so it tells you. But put the trailing dot. You won't get there. The yeah, you're you're gonna you're gonna get sick of typing the trailing dot. You're also gonna get sick of typing UUID. So, or hopefully you're cutting and pasting them. But you'll get sick of that as well. Okay. Okay. So at this point, what I'd like to do is we'll go ahead and create our first domain and we'll show that this, this uh, not only is it updating the storage for designate, but it's also doing the work um, 
on the, on the DNS server in the back end. In our case, it's PowerDNS. Uh, we'll run some dig commands. We'll, we'll take a look at uh, what, what, what it did. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you what the other users see when it comes to what we did when we created that domain, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to another user, user one. Again, this is all in your home directory. Make sure you're in the home directory of Vagrant to do this. Uh, I switched over to the user one user. I'm gonna do a designate domain list. And not surprisingly, there is no domain. All we've done is created a server at this point, the example.com server, uh, I'm sorry, ns.example.com server, so we don't have a domain. So let's create our first domain. Designate, domain create, give it a name, um, .com. Make sure you put the trailing dot or you'll get an error. <laughs> and we'll give it an email address. Okay, so we've created our first domain. So this has done several things for us. It, it, it went ahead and added it to the designate database. So if I do a designate domain list, you, not surprisingly, the domain's there. But more importantly for us is if I take a look at what happened in PowerDNS, let's look at the SOA record first. It created, uh, it created our first uh, zone. So you guys see here the SOA record in the answer section, okay? Not surprisingly, the uh, primary DNS for that SOA, uh, for that zone is ns.example.com. Um, if you go ahead and query for the name service for that zone, okay, I'm querying for the name service for that zone. Um, it's the ns.example.com. So it created, it created that record there. Yes? Uh, how is the serial chosen? Uh, how is the serial chosen? Kyle? It's just timestamp implementing Yeah. Okay, so we did all this work as user one. If you remember, user one is part of tenant A. Um, user two is also part of tenant A. So it shouldn't be a surprise that if we switch over to the user two and we do a designate domain list, we can see that domain, okay? So if you uh, go ahead and source open RC user two, you do your designate domain list, you see that user two sees it. It's part of the same tenant, okay? Zones are owned by tenants. Now, if you switch over to user three, you would not expect to see it. So let's go ahead and switch over to user three. I do my designate domain list. And there's no domain there, okay? That domain is owned by tenant A. Tenant B does not have this domain. Let's go, go ahead and real quick, just because I want to show you a delete, we'll go ahead and create a, a domain here real quick, a test domain and then we'll delete it just, just so you guys can see the delete. But uh, we'll do a designate domain create. We'll call it test.com. Don't forget the trailing dot. Email. And I must type something wrong. Designate domain create test.com. Email, I typed email wrong. DNS at test.com. Okay, so we created the test.com domain. Uh, you can do your designated domain list again. Not a surprise, test.com's there. If you wanna do your dig, you can do your dig. I'm not gonna do it, um, but I will do a designate domain delete. And you pass it the UUID for that domain. Hit return, and it deleted it. So if I do a designate domain list, you'll see that the domain is gone, okay? So, and it did it all on the back end as well. I, I saved time here, um, just showed you that it did it in the database. So are there any questions where we're at right now? 
So I've shown you, we've, we've worked with servers, we've worked with domains. If you attended the earlier session, there's only one other thing I need to show you from, the, from version one of the API, and that's working with records, right? So let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and switch over to that. So we've gone through this. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and create our first record in DNS using designate. Okay, let's switch over to user two. Okay, we'll do our designate domain list. The reason we're doing this is we need that UUID again. Um, because when you create the record, you need to tell it the UUID, uh, you need to tell it what domain that record's in, um, even though you're going to specify a fully qualified domain name, <laughs> okay? With a trailing dot. Uh, so let's go ahead and do a designate record create. We'll call it server A, example.com. Don't forget the trailing dot. It's gonna be an A record. We'll give it, um, a dummy IP address, one, two, three, four. You can type whatever you want. And we have to pass it the um, UUID for the domain. When I hit return, we have created our first record. Uh, we've created an A record called uh, serverA.example.com. So not surprisingly, if I do a designate record list and I pass it the domain ID, There's the record. If we, if we query the back end, server A, example.com, and on the answer section there, you can see that we've created an A record with the IP address of 1234. Okay, so very similar to the domains, the user two is in tenant A. I'm gonna switch over to user one. and I'll do a designate record list. You're gonna need that domain ID again. <laughs> if, if you remember the command is domain list, if you don't have it there already uh, in your buffer, hit return. And not surprisingly, user one can see this record as well. What happened, what about, eh. what about user three? Okay, switch over to user three. It's in a different tenant. We'll do our designate record list again. And this time it tells us domain's not found. So user three can't do anything with the domain. We don't see the record, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and delete the record now, but I'm not gonna delete the record using user two, the, the user that created it. I'm gonna delete the record using user one just to show you that anybody who's a member any user, any account that's a member of that tenant can work with these records. So let's go ahead and switch over to user one. We'll do a designate record list on that domain again. Sure enough, our, our record's still there. And let's go ahead and delete it. Designate record list, give it the ID. I'm sorry, record delete, give it the ID and hit return, and it didn't work. Okay, this is, this is, this is the fun with the IDs. I gave, it, I gave it the ID of the uh, domain, right? We also need the ID for the record. So let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and give it both. And what's the order? Well, you, you give the domain ID first, then you give the record. I get this messed up all the time. If you don't remember, you can go back into your designate, if you're in the, if you're in the um, in the shell, the designate shell, you can, you can get more help off of those commands. Just type help command, it'll, it'll give you more information. So I'll do designate record delete. I don't think I've gotten this right in any of, uh, any of the demos, uh, even all the pre stuff, so I, I keep getting this one wrong. But we'll give it the, uh, the ID for the domain first, followed by the ID of the record. Yeah. Kyle's going to talk to you later about uh, he's going to recruit you to help, and you will help help us make this more user friendly. So, 
Um, I did the record delete. Um, let's go ahead and do a list. Yeah, yeah. Now you see why there's a shell, so you don't have to. Uh. I got to give it the ID for the uh, domain. So hang on, domain list, designate record list. Give it the ID for the domain. Let's see, control V. I share your pain, by the way. <laughs> and sure enough, there is no record there. Okay. So go ahead and flip back over to the slides here for you. We've walked through these slides. These slides are going to be made available to you guys. Um, you have the thumb drive with the information about installing. These slides will be made available too. So if you want to, if you want to walk through this again outside of outside of here, you you have that opportunity. Um, are there any questions before I move on? Yes. Yeah, there is, there is an option to, to change the TTLs. I don't know if the client has every option for the SOA record, but that is available in the API. But but you do you can change the TTLs from 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 the designate client. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the question was, uh, can I change the TTL? The default the, there's going to be a default TTL that that's that's uh, used for those records. Can I change it? And the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, I don't want I don't want to show it, but yeah, you can do it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, good question that was asked at an earlier session, and the answer is yes. HP has been working on a plugin for Horizon, um, and and it's their intent that to make it available to the community at, at some point in the future. Okay. They, yes. Is server list is for yeah. Server list is is for admin the admin user. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Good. We're going to move on. And let's go ahead and talk about the next piece here, which I think will probably be important to those of you that are running the rest of the OpenStack um, components. So how do we integrate Designate with everything else? OK, what we're talking about here is Designate Sync. Uh, I think we had a question earlier, are we, we're not running Sync now. That's correct. We weren't running Sync. We will be starting up Sync here shortly. Um, what happens with Sync? is sync um, is, is interface to the other OpenStack components. The other OpenStack components send notification events out. Uh, sync custom handlers are registered with designate sync. Those handlers tell it, uh, tell, tell designate sync which events it wants to consume. Designate sync will pick up those events, pass them off to the appropriate designate handler, which you guys will be writing. Uh, for your organization, and then um, designate sync uh, will will perform whatever DNS operations you've you've written into the custom handler. Um, if you attended the earlier meeting, we we had a lot more slides on this this particular subject, but we'll I'll just do this again real quick. So designate sync consumes notification events from Nova, Neutron, and potentially other OpenStack services. Okay, what designate sync's job is to take those events, and what's an example of event? VM create. I create a VM, that's an event. Um, that event gets published onto uh, the message queue. Sync hears it. Hey, I have a handler that needs to do something with that, hands it off to the handler. Then what the handler does is it performs DNS operations based on, based on that message, okay? What events and what DNS operations we're talking about here are handled by custom notification handlers. Uh, designate ships with two custom notification handlers that are, I'm, Kyle, don't take this wrong, but they're a little bit brain dead. They're just there as examples. Um, both of them, uh, you hard code the domain that you're going to be dealing with, and they create A records. Okay, so there's one for Nova when Nova events occur, and there's one for uh, Neutron when floating IP events occur. And it'll delete that A record as well. Okay, they, they weren't written for you guys to use per se, they were written as an example for you to, to take those to the next step for your business. Okay? Are there any questions about that before I go on? No. Okay, in the image that you have in front of you, 
Uh, we've already enabled Nova to send a notification to the appropriate topic um, to be picked up by um, Designate. We haven't do configured Designate yet, but we've configured Nova already. So these changes have already been made to the Nova con. So if you look at Etsy, Nova, Nova.con file, you'll see that these, these three lines are already in there. Um, the notification topic is the topic that we're going we're gonna to consume the message from um, in Designate Sync. Uh, the notify on state change is, is a directive to uh, Nova that anytime a VM state changes, I need you to publish a message about this. If you've done anything with Solometer, this is probably familiar to you because it's the same thing you have to do to get Solometer to, to eat these messages. Okay? Neutron configuration changes, very similar. The only difference is you don't have to give it a directive to tell it, hey, I want you to actually publish these events. Um, in, the, in this case, we're publishing to the same uh, topic the topic that we are going to configure designate to consume. Okay. Okay. So we're going to make these changes right now to your um, your designate cont file. But what we're going to do is we're going to enable designate sync in the designate cont file, and we're going to do that by giving it um, notification handlers. And it's important to understand if you don't want to run sync, fine. You don't need to run sync. Designate works just fine. Um, if you do want sync running, you can register one or more uh, notification handlers to do whatever business operations you need DSNS to do for you. So one or more um, handlers could be registered here. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. Everybody here knows how to use VI, I hope. If you don't, you're in the wrong room, <laughs> the wrong conference. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and switch over to uh, our shell. Okay. And if you remember from uh, Manuel's discussion earlier, we're down in uh, des from the home directory, just to make sure everybody's in the home directory vagrant, we go down into designate. Um, it was in Etsy designate. And there's a file in here called designate.conf. Let's go ahead and edit that. Look for, look for sync. And all you have to do is uncomment the line that says enable notification handlers. And uh, we're going to actually enable both the uh, both both of the um, I guess we'll call it uh, reference uh, notification handlers, the Nova and the Neutron one. We're only going to use Nova though in the demo, but but we'll go ahead and enable them both. Okay. After you're done uncommenting that line, look for the Nova fixed one first, and let's uncomment the the, the three lines in in that stanza in the config file. Uh, you'll see that we have a domain ID notification topic. Not a surprise there. It's monitor. That's the, that's the topic that we told Nova and Neutron to publish to. Um, the exchange, we're using the Nova exchange for the Nova handler, and we're going to use the Neutron exchange for the Neutron handler. The format. Now, the format is interesting. This is going to be the format for, for the fully qualified um, domain name for the A record that, that this, this handler creates. Um, there's more information on what else you can do with this, but right now what we're going to do is whatever display name we supply when we create the VM will be the name of the record followed by the domain. You could have it be the octets for the IP address that it gets. There's, you, there's any number of things you can do here, um, but in this case we're going to use the display name followed by the, by the, the domain name or the zone name. Okay. And, and if you attended my earlier meeting, you'll hear me intermix domain and zone. For designates purposes, there is a distinction between domains and zones, but for designates purposes, um, you can use them interchangeably because domain maps to zone one. It's a one-to-one -one mapping. At least now there is. I see a hand. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. What? Uh, what did I uncomment first? Can you stand up and go to the mic? I can't hear you. Yeah. He says, what did you uncomment Oh, what I uncommented at first is uh, look for the word sync. Um, in, the stinks, in the sync stands, I come uncomment at the notification handlers. Okay? Let me get back to where we were. Okay, so you've got this domain ID here. What, there's something missing, right? We need to actually give it a domain ID. So let's go ahead and escape down to our shell. 
um, from within VI. And let's go ahead and capture that domain ID. So um, I'm going to do a designate domain list. And the domain ID for the VMs that we're going to create, we're going to use the example.com domain. And so let's capture that ID and cut and paste that back up into our, our uh, shell, I mean into our VI session. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. If you guys are VI guys, hopefully you can make that happen. I did a domain, a designate domain list. I used the yeah user user one right. You should be already in that in that user, but user one is or user two. Anybody who's in tenant A can can list it. Yes. So that means when I have multiple domains, I need multiple handlers. No, what that means is you're going to write a custom handler to handle that. This is this is a brain dead default handler that ships with designate. Um, I don't, Kyle. I don't think it's your intent that anybody's actually going to use it in production or anything. It's just <laughs> so uh, it it's pretty it's pretty brain dead. So yeah, you would you would write a custom notification handler to to handle this the way you need to handle it. Okay, this is this is just an example handler. It's a starting point for you. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep moving here because I know I know we're getting toward the getting toward the end. I'm, I'm gonna give Kyle a opportunity to recruit some of you. I also uh, know there, there's probably gonna be some questions. So let's go ahead and um, I'm sorry, go ahead and hit Y Y or whatever you need to do. Let's cut and paste this. We're gonna take it down to the neutron floating handler as well and just replace the domain ID down there, and then go ahead and uncomment the rest of uh, those lines. I don't think I need to explain explain again, but you know, again, the control exchange and the topic or the, the topic are, are are where we're going to consume these messages from. Just just to repeat, we're we're enabling both the Nova and the Neutron uh, handlers that ship with Designate. We're only going to look at the Nova one today. Okay, so go ahead and get out of this. Save that off. Now we're we'll going ahead and. Um, you know, we don't really need to, to cycle um, designate, but I, I found with OpenStack, a lot of times you think you know what's going to happen, and you know you end up cycling, especially when it comes to Nova, you end up cycling something, you realize you needed to cycle several other things. So let's go ahead and cycle all these while we're at it. Um, you really don't need to, but let's do a kill all on designate API. So we're going to stop the designate API. We'll go ahead and do the same thing with um, Designate central. Okay. And then let's go ahead and restart central. Let's go ahead and restart the API. And let's go ahead and uh, start up sync. So we will have sync, uh, the service running now. Does everybody have sync up and running? At least everybody that's going to be following. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is let's uh, back to our home directory. Let's make sure we're user one. Um, we're going to we're going to go ahead and create we're going to create our first VM. Uh, we're going to do it from the command line using Nova. So we need an image. So let's get our image list. We're going to need this ID, so go ahead and cut and paste that. Okay. We're going to get our flavors, although I know what flavor we're going to use. We're going to use the smallest one, which is going to be one. But we'll go ahead and get a list of flavors. Hey, we'll use one. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and do our Nova boot. Uh, the next piece of boot that I'm supplying there is going to be the display name. So not surprisingly, we're going to create a record here. Hopefully the record will be in example.com because that's what we configured in the designate.com file. So what we should get is an A record that's called testvm.example.com with some IP address. So let's do Nova boot test VM, our image, supply our image. 
And then finally, let's supply our flavor. When you've got that, hit return. You do your Nova list. And at some point, hopefully soon, it's active. So if this is the first one you've created, you probably have an IP address very similar to mine, uh, 172.31.252.3. You'll notice that's the tenant, tenant A network. Not surprising, we're in, we're in tenant A for this work. Um, if I do my designate domain list, and I do my designate record list off of that domain ID, we hope that we have a record. So there's our A record, okay? If we run dig, just to prove that the back end did its job, sure enough, there's our, there's our A record, okay? So, uh, again, the, uh, the notification handler I'm demoing is just a reference notification handler. It's just for you guys, to, a starting point for you guys. You guys will be customizing it for yourself. And if you attended the earlier session, we actually went through some use cases. eBay, I showed you eBay's use case, which was a little bit complex, and I believe Graham went through, through uh, what may or may not be HP's use case. So, um, let's go ahead and delete this VM. Test VM, do a Nova list, it's gone. So not surprisingly, if I do my designate record list on that, um, on that domain example.com, the record's gone. And, and if you just want to prove that, you can do a dig on localhost test VM dot example.com, okay? And, 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 and the A record's not there. We got the SOA record as an answer, but the A record's not there. So we're, we're, we're out of there. Okay, so uh, I believe that concludes the demo portion of, yep, let's, I'm sorry, let me go back. The demo portion of this. Are there any questions about what we went over? Yes. Oops. Okay. I'm on mic. Okay. Uh, the question was: Does it work with Havana? Does it? Does the Vagrant image work with uh, Havana? And and the answer was yes. Okay. Are are there any other questions? Okay. If there are no questions, I'm going to hand you over to Kyle, who's going to attempt to get you guys excited about the project and come aboard and help us and fix things like. I, uh, being able to use the client a little bit easier and things like that. So go ahead, Kyle. Thank you. This th yep, this thing is on. All right, so first off, I'm going to say I hate standing in front of crowds and talking. So uh, yeah, first off, there's a bunch of links. Um, you don't, I will publish these online. There's a link at the end. Uh, it contains all of the useful things on getting started contributing to designate or generally OpenStack. So the first bunch is things like you know, uh, the how to contribute primer from, which is a general OpenStack link. We follow all the OpenStack processes. So we're on StackForge, the CLA will be needed. We use Launchpad for bugs and blueprints. Um, so if you contributed to any other OpenStack project, this is going to be familiar. Yeah. The rest are designate specific links, so um, our documentation, our specific launchpad, bug and blueprints tracker, um, and some other useful bits. So bare necessities, designate does the vast majority of our communication on IRC. Um, so if you want to get involved, having a good IRC client, come join the OpenStack DNS room, you'll find us there you know, pretty much any time besides this week. We have a weekly IRC meeting, which uh, is on Wednesdays at 1700 UTC. Um, it's 
free for everyone to attend. It's, the agenda is open for anyone to add items to. The link is there. It's wiki.openstack.org slash wiki meetings designate. Um, if there's anything you think we're missing, anything you want to add, any, you, anything you think we should be adding, um, please go ahead, file bugs, file blueprints, and add it to the, uh, the meeting agenda beforehand. We'll, uh, we'll bring it up during the meeting, and we'll see if we can help. All right, so for people who are interested in contributing, uh, the vast majority of designated pieces are pluggable. So everything from the V1 API endpoints, you can add plugins which will add more. V2 will do that eventually. Storage drivers, which is our communication to the database. Today we have a SQL Alchemy plugin. You could write a MongoDB plugin or something else if you wanted tomorrow. Then the backend drivers, which is our DNS server communication. So today we have ParaDNS, NSD4, Red Hat's free IPA, Dynect, which used to be DYN DNS, and uh, Bind9, kind of. We're fixing that this, this cycle. So by the end of June, oh, if you're looking to use Bind, it should be perfect. And finally, the notification handlers are plugins as well. Uh, there was a couple of questions on those. So if you look in the designate Git repository in the contrib folder, there's an example plugin. So it's an example out of tree plugin, how you would add your own company's stuff. Uh, without actually having to fork, designate, and add it. So we have two APIs, as was mentioned, the, the version 1, the version 2. The version 1 is based on Flask. Um, all of the OpenStack services seem to be slowly standardizing on Pecan, at least the newer ones. Uh, so that's being used for version 2. The API layer is intentionally as lightweight as possible. So. We basically do validations, basic syntax validations. Is this a valid host name? That kind of stuff at the API layer. Then the, the message will get popped onto the queue. Designate Central will pick it up and do the heavy lifting. The reason for that is we've always had multiple APIs in mind. So we've always had the REST API. Uh, we're introducing a, essentially a DNS API, where you'll be able to uh, do zone transfers to the to the real DNS servers via that API, you'll be able to do uh, NS updates to it at some point in the future as well. And then there's the sync, which is essentially a message bus API. So we've, we've centralized all of the logic in central. Uh, the API, so API, sync, MDNS are all going to be very lightweight. Uh, version one is we're trying to keep it in maintenance mode. It's, um, we're trying to get v2 stable and ready to go. Uh, so we're trying not to add new features to version 1. But um, we will if we have to. So um, kind of already mentioned some of this. Uh, the central service is our core service. Pretty much everything belongs in there. Um, if it's not something specific to do with, uh, with implementing a particular API, HTTP REST, or DNS API, or Rabbit API, then it probably belongs in Designate Central. So, um, as I said, I hate talking, so I kept this short. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Yes, that's on Freenode alongside all of the other. Uh, the question was, is the IRC channel on Freenode? The answer is yes, it's on Freenode alongside all of the other OpenStack uh, IRC channels. And, and all, all of us here are all of us here are usually on. Um, some of us uh, live in other countries, so they're on at different times, but there's usually somebody on to answer your questions. Any other questions? Do you guys have package builds? Do we have package builds? Yeah. So there's a PPA on Launchpad under launchpad.net slash designate PPA. Um, I haven't updated those for the latest release, but they will be at some point. Uh, there's also packages in Debian and Unstable now uh, for Designate. I think that's our latest, latest release that just got pushed in there. Um, I'm not sure. There's been a couple of people who have made Fedora and Red Hat RPMs. I've never actually, they've never been sent to me, so I don't, I don't know if they're open or not. Um, do you guys, does any of the, the Red Hat folks in the I've, room know? I've made some already, and I can help you with making them, but I don't think they're out there yet. Yeah, it's going to be Denmark too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, most of the organization already have a DNS um, running. So is this like one that already DNS, or is it just for only OpenStack within the OpenStack? So, yes, it, it can work. 
Oh, sorry, repeat the question. Uh, so the question is, can uh, most enterprises already have a DNS service of, of some kind deployed? Can this coexist, or is this only for OpenStack? So yes and no, it can coexist. It, you can reuse the same DNS servers. You do have some catch-22s. For example, des if, you, if a domain already exists on your back-end DNS server but Designate knows nothing about it, someone goes to try and create that, it's going to error. Uh, that's a, Designate expects to be able to create any domain that it doesn't already have. So it doesn't uh, query all the way to the back to check if it's pre-existing. Um, so with that caveat in mind, yes. Uh, if that caveat's not acceptable, then no. So not necessarily. So you, there's loads of ways that it could be done. One is you just, if you've got pre-existing zones that you don't want to be, that, that you don't want on this, then you have to enforce nobody creates them. We have a, a blacklist feature that you can list them all out, and nobody will be able to create those. And you'll be able to continue using the, you know, the pre-existing zones just like you did, and you can add more, do whatever you want with it. The other way is potentially you only want to delegate part of your, if you're companya.com, you might want to delegate, you know, officea.companya.com to designate while keeping the rest separately. And that, that can be done as well. So there's, there's generally a bunch of different ways that you can make it coexist. Um, but up to now, so far, we've mainly been concentrating on we own the DNS servers, and we will, we will manage them, essentially. And, and there are tools to help you migrate um, from your existing DNS into Designate if you want Designate to be the source of record for that stuff. Power DNS. Uh, so well, the one we tested today. Uh, sorry, the question was: uh, Do any of the DNS servers support multi-master? Uh, yes, essentially. Um, we have some problems, and the multi-master situation is one of the big reasons that we call bind kind of works. Um, Power DNS uses a database, so you're free to replicate your database however you wish. Um, so it only needs a read-only replica. That's relatively easy to do, even across continents. Um, for the likes of bind and so on, we would have to coordinate the, the, the record create, record delete, all of the actions across every server. What happens when one of them's down? Um, so that's why we're introducing this cycle, the, the mini DNS or MDNS service, which uh, will help will help us fix that situation. So for the likes of bind and so on, things should become a lot more reliable. Are there any other questions? It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a bad name, I think, but it's <laughs> just designate dash MDNS. Yeah, it's, um, it's a piece, it's gonna be another piece of uh, designate. You know, we have yep. the designate API, designate central, designate uh, sync, there yep. will be a designate mini DNS. Yeah, yeah. so the designate MDNS will be a, will make use of the DNS Python library, it will stand itself up on port 53, you'll be able to send queries to it, we won't expect end users to ever actually put, publish that, but we would expect that you would take your real name servers, bind PowerDNS, point them at that as the hidden master. So that should one of your machines be down and a couple of records were added, it's okay. DNS zone transfers, you know, that's a standard way of dealing with that. You will always end up with a consistent set. And it makes the implementation for for you know, multiple different types of DNS servers that might be somewhere centralized in a database, some are zone files on disk that aren't shared, some need a, a minor slave zone file, some need a full zone file. So it gets awful complicated when you start multiplying that by the number of DNS servers people start asking for. So um, we've started holding off with you know, any additional DNS servers. So we had a question today about uh, DJB DNS and another one. Um, everybody has their own opinion on what the best DNS server is, and we want to let them use that. But we're going to try and get this mini DNS thing in so that we can actually do every single one of them reliably, uh, rather than you know, only ones that have their own inbuilt replication, like PowerDNS being really, really reliable. Yeah, and that's targeted for Juno. So yeah. at the end of this, at the, like you said, at the end of the cycle, we'll, we will have that done. Uh, you said, is the microphone not on? Uh, you said that um, you can support any DNS backend. Can you plug that out of the tree as well? Yes. Oh, so uh, I, was that a question on the microphone? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay, so uh, all of the things I listed as plugin interfaces can be done out of tree. Um, so it uses just Python entry points. Um, uh, you just have to have your own package register an entry point in designate dot storage or designate dot backends, and uh, we'll load the appropriate one. The sample we gave, the sample in tree is uh, an ex a handler because that's the one we get asked the most about. But essentially, it'd be identical. Just change the handlers to um, to storage or, or backend and. Make sure you implement the right APIs in the class you, you, you advertise. OK, we got a few more minutes. What DNS backend would you give for OK. So we have a couple minutes. Does anybody have any more questions? OK. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, hope to see you again.